Awesome, it works. All right, how's it going, everybody? So, been having some problems with the uh, Facebook Live uh, starting it up. Uh, I think it's because uh, it probably in is in an overload. Um, so tonight, uh, this is going to be uh, that I'm Scott Fisher from Flish, uh, Fisher Flyworks. Um, and this is part four of the Hitchhiker's Guide to Fly Tying. And tonight I am going to be focusing on, um, mounting hooks, uh, mounting thread. Hey Tim, what's up man? Uh, I'm going to be focusing on mounting hooks to your vise, uh, mounting your thread onto, um, the hook. And also going to walk through how to finish a basic fly. So uh, tonight, I have my stuff out for the first time ready to tie for you guys. I know I've been doing a lot of blabbing. Uh, and I just kind of wanted to start the foundation from the get-go right. And it does need some explaining first before our hands start doing their thing. So I, uh, I did a lot of talking because I, I really wanted to explain certain things first before we, we jump in blind. Uh, so what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to, I'm going to, this is the first time I've ever done this, uh, in this kind of way. Hopefully it works out well. If not, I'll learn as I go, uh, which is okay too. That's the fun part. Um, but this is the first time I'm going to be actually tying on camera. So uh, maybe some things will work and, and maybe they won't, uh, let me know if you can't see anything too. Um, really, uh, say something if you can't see it or, or it's unclear or anything like that. It, that's fine. I'll change it. Uh, so before I get into it, just to kind of give you guys a heads up when I do tie the fly, uh, I am not tying anything. I'm not tying anything specific, um, per se, uh, I'm really just tying uh, anything that I feel like that's going to represent what it is that I'm really um, trying to convey. Uh, so the pattern is going to be a pattern that I tend to tie very easily, very frequently. Uh, I don't really think that there, there is a particular name to it. It's pretty similar to a March Brown wet. Um, but I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna use some materials just to show you what I'm talking about. It's more about the technique than, than what I'm tying. So, uh, you know, th these techniques apply to, uh, a, a lot of things. I just want to get, uh, for you guys that have never seen someone tie before, uh, this is your chance to watch someone do it. For the guys that are beginning, uh, to learn how to tie, this is particularly good for you guys because I'm going to show you the basic things of how to how to start and how to how to go through it and finish it. Uh, so keep in mind that the whole point of me doing this is to show you uh, the steps uh, to to accomplish tying a fly from start to finish. Don't mind so much about you know well what pattern is he tying? What what is that? No one cares. Who cares? <laughs> so, uh, whatever it comes out to be is what it's going to be, but it's, 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 uh, used as the, the, the teaching tool. Uh, so first I'm going to, uh, start off with, um, I got some stuff ready. Um, again, for the guys that joined me in the beginning, this is a bobbin. So what I'm going to do is, uh, the color is a rust that's going to work. Uh, with the rest of uh, the pattern, uh, so I did predetermine roughly color-wise what the what the fly is going to have in it. Uh, Mister Frickin' Powers, what's going on? Tom, what's going on, man? Uh, thanks for thanks for joining. So what I'm going to do is uh, first I'm going to show you how to actually thread it. I never did that um, in the other video and show it to you how I do it. So. Um, I, I said in the in the in the video uh, I can't remember which one, but some people the old way of doing it is to not use a tool at all. Uh, you would take the thread uh, if the thread is not frayed at the tip because that makes things a little bit more difficult. All right, so I'm gonna do is I'm gonna I'm gonna take the the tip of the thread and I'm gonna put it into the barrel of the the bobbin. And I, when I, when I, <laughs> thanks Tom, uh, so when I, uh, suck the thread out of the bobbin, um, 
I'm doing it in like these kind of these short, um, these short slurping bursts that kind of thing to, to, to get it to jump up and through the barrel. Uh, I noticed that that works better for me instead of just one long continuous like straw sucking. So uh, just do a couple of short little and uh, you'll feel it kind of touch the tongue and then and then just kind of pull it out. Uh, that's if you don't have a tool. That's one way of starting it. And then another way of starting it is to actually have what they call a bobbin threader. Uh, and thanks for everybody that's joining tonight. I see the numbers up to 23. That's awesome. Stick around. Um, so this is a bobbin threader. Uh, and for people that, that have a really hard time uh, getting it through that way or don't really have the patience to fuss, what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to take the tip of this and and you can see it it's kind of like a little it's kind of like a little diamond and what I do is I I take the tip I push it through gently not to really scrape anything too hard right and what happens is it pops out the other end there maybe it's better down here um and then I'm going to take that thread and that's all I need is just a tiny bit that goes through that diamond Otherwise, if you put too much thread through that diamond and pull through, you end up ripping the thread and wasting like about that much of thread just to, to don't, I mean, I particularly don't really do that because I like to, I don't like to waste. Uh, so you only, you, the thread that you need to put through is about that as much as, as long as it gets a grip and then pull and there's your thread. So you could use a threader as well and there's different types, um, you know, whatever, Whatever one you land on will do the job. You don't have to do anything too fancy. Um, so once the thread is through the bobbin, again, I'm not really a guy that likes to waste a lot of thread for absolutely no reason. I know on a lot of videos they'll have, you know, like Tim Flagler, you'll see, not to say that he wastes anything, but uh, it's for the video, but he'll wrap his finger around the thread and then he'll, once the thread's mounted onto the hook, he'll, he'll, he'll pull the other way real quick and it snaps it off. Um, that's one way of doing it. If you want to do it that way, you, you know, it, it's a, uh, it, the problem is, is that you, you're using a pretty good amount of thread just to wrap it around your finger to get the grip on it before you yank it and, and break off the thread. So I don't really feel like it's, it's, practical uh for me uh it's one way of doing it but uh if you don't feel like picking up your scissors uh but i i don't really like to do that i like to grab as a small bit as possible so um so once that's ready to go i'm going to take my hook now this hook is a size uh... okay so this is a size 10 it's a wet fly hook uh what the hell is a wet fly <laughs> so a wet a wet fly is um think of it as a fly that kind of looks like a like a mini salmon fly. Uh it, it's it's a it's a fly that goes under the water. Um and when you when you fish this fly, it it has a lot of movement and it has that very classic look. And you're going to know by, what I mean by that when I start to actually tie it. But the hook is a little bit specific to uh, that style. It's a very traditional style. Wet flies are, are, are some of the oldest ones. Uh, and it's a size 10. It's got a downward, it's got a downward eye and it is barbless. Uh, so when I, when I mount the hook... When you're starting off in the very beginning and you're mounting the hook, you don't want to have the whole vice swallow the fucking thing. Um, it, that's not that's not good either because you can't really get in there. The, it's gonna get it's gonna be covering too much of of the hook. So uh, really, what you want to do is is find that bottom bend, and I like to find it right there and. Guys, give me a thumbs up or, or something that shows me that you can see what I'm doing. Uh, let me know if, if that's that's visible to you guys. Because if, if it is, then then I know I'm good. I have a lot of... I have comments and stuff that's covering where what I'm doing. Can you guys see okay? Yes? Looks good to me. So, uh, so once that's mounted... Um, Hey, Cameron, thanks. I appreciate it. it it's I love this vice. Uh, so I'm going to find my sweet spot when I'm mounting the hook. 
And again, that's really just that bottom bend, and I just need enough to keep the hook on there and it doesn't budge. Uh, what you don't want to do for safety reasons is watch where you bite on the hook because if you if you if you're too hesitant with with how much you're 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 biting onto the hook and it's not enough, that pressure, especially regals, because the tension is squeezing at all times, um, it could actually pew and the the fucking fly the the hook will fly off and you'll hear it somewhere in your house. Uh, so you got to be careful. Don't mount. Uh, thanks, Eric. I swiped the words to right. And then the comments are not in the way. Gotcha. Okay. Well, that works. I, um, then I'm going to have, some, I'm going to have, uh, my better half maybe read me the comments, uh, so that I can see what I'm doing. Okay, uh, Eric, thanks, dude. Um, so that's, that's much better. All right. So, so with that being said, be careful with how you mount the hook. You don't want to you don't want to have it too shallow, and you don't want to mount it too deep where it's where it's uh, it kind of suffocating the damn thing. So what I'm gonna do is to start the thread. I'm gonna I'm gonna start. I always leave space behind the eye. Um, imagine that there's another eye right behind it, and that's the distance that I start. And it doesn't it, it doesn't really matter what the hell the pattern is. If, if you end up going past that point later on because it doesn't matter in that pattern, good. Um, but it's good to do that with all of them so that you always know that that's kind of your spot where you need to put the brakes on when you're getting towards the end of the fly. Because when, you're, when you uh, cover the hook eye, um, when you finish and you can't get your, your tippet through it, uh, you just tied a fly really for nothing, and that that sucks. So, and and that's also a good that's also a sign that I look for in a well tied fly uh, is how they finish the heads. Uh, and that's just me. I like to see how they finish their work, and if it's if it's crowded shit towards the front of the eye and stuff, uh, that that usually doesn't look so good. It's kind of doesn't really show much control and stuff like that. A really nice finished fly will always have a very pretty head uh that shows you know uh the work being finished properly so uh i always uh imagine that there's another eye behind the hook eye and that's where i start my thread so i'm gonna i'm gonna take the thread i'm pulling with this hand and i'm gonna i'm gonna go down and i'm gonna go one two three and then i'm gonna walk it back down the shank a few times and at that point, it's not going to go anywhere because you started your thread going this way and then you walked it back going that way and now the um, now the thread is, is mounted on the hook. This is the point where you would take the tag and you'd clip it. So like I said, it's very easy to waste a lot of material in that, that very initial step that you really don't need to do. Uh, so don't go crazy with, that, with, the, uh, with the length on there. You don't need much to start the hook. That's my beer. Uh, so again, thanks for joining, guys. I don't know if I can see all the... Um, so the next thing I'm going to do once that's started is, um, and this is a really big important thing too, is how to flatten and cord your thread. Um, I remember when I first started fly tying, I did not understand how the fuck to do that at all. I was, I just didn't get it. I didn't know which way it was corded up. Uh, I, had, I had no idea, and they'd say, oh, we'll spin clockwise, we'll spin counterclockwise. And you're like, yeah, but from what fucking perspective? I, I don't know, who's looking where? And does that mean if I was looking down at it? Does that mean if I was looking up at it from the side of it, from your perspective, my perspective? I, I don't really, I don't really fucking know what you're talking about, it, you know? So... <laughs> the, the I had like this epiphany moment when I finally figured out how to uncord and flatten the thread that they always talk about, and um, I, I gotta tell you that once you, when you learn how to flatten and cord your thread, it's gonna open up like a whole new world there, just in something so simple. Um, so what I do when I want to flatten my thread and keep my bodies very, very even is I'm going to take a really close look at right underneath, I'm going to show you, right underneath the hook, you're going to see your thread, 
And at this point where the thread meets the hook shank, I focus my eyes down into that little area. And what I'm looking for is this V that forms. And the V will form and then the thread will start to, to wrap naturally because of the way it's manufactured, right? So when I'm looking for that V, if I don't see the V, that means it's corded. And if I see the V, that means that I'm getting it flat, but that the rest of it, as it's like this Y, imagine, uh, as I go down, I need to see more of that. So, so I know that I'm on the right track if I'm seeing the thread spread apart. And imagine that this is actually your hook shank. Um, you could see the thread split this way, and it's flattening on top of the shank. But as you go down... Uh, you still have a little bit of work to do. So how the hell do you do that? Uh, so what I, what I do is, and, and my suggestion for you guys that I'm going to try to zoom out here so you don't really have to see my face too much. Christopher said nice PBR. Oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Chris. Uh, so I'm going to try to zoom out so that I'm not all up on this, but I, it's not working. Hold on one second. This is not really... I got in, but I can't get out. Okay, cool. So, uh, so when I do this, I'm going to explain this from my perspective, not yours. If you were sitting behind the vise, I am going to spin the bobbin going my right. I'm going to rotate it going right like this. So if I was if I was a if I was a person looking up at a shower head, <laughs> which is if I was looking up at my bobbin and watching it spin from underneath, it's spinning clockwise. Does that make sense? So that's how I would that's how I uncord the thread. That's how I flatten the thread. I'm going to spin it clockwise if I was my perspective was is that I was looking up at my bobbin. Right, so in my perspective from here, I'm spinning it to my right, uh, and from your view, you're you're seeing it weird. So just always put your put your perspective on my side. I'm spinning it right. Um, so once I once I spin it, I'm gonna give myself some length, and I'm gonna spin it until I see that that V shape that I was talking about. I'm gonna look for that V shape, but I want to see the V become this very elongated kind of um, uh, needle point. That's how I know that my thread's getting flat, is when I see it widen out down, right? So as as it flattens, and I could see if you take a bobbin, you could actually, you could actually uh, comb your thread underneath to see if it flattens. And right now I'm seeing it uh, go straight down. So that, that's a really, that's a, that's a good look. So when I know that I have a thread flattened, keep in mind that as you wrap down the hook, you're cording it back up again. So you do it again to flatten it and do it again to flatten it if you want a smooth body. So I'm going to go, I'm going to just wrap. And as I'm doing this, my, my tension on the bobbin is that I'm using my hand as a brake system as I'm doing this as well so that I could slow down or speed up or control how much thread is getting um, fed out onto the hook. So when I, when I feel like my bobbin is getting away from the hook, uh, then I, then I slightly tighten up. And, and if I want it to g give a little bit more then I, then I relax my grip a tiny bit. And then that gives you what you're looking for. So I'm going to bring this thread down until I reach just before it starts to bend. All right. And I'm going to let it hang. If I want to flatten it again, I'm going to look at that point where the thread meets the shank, that under, under the belly, and look for that V again. And I'm going to spin it until I see it open up. And I could touch this to slow it down. Look at that. All right. So the, so the next thing that I would put on is a tail. Uh, so I'm using hen saddle. Uh, it's really good for tail, soft hackle, everything. I could tie a wet fly just with this shit alone. Um, so I could, I could take 
a piece, whatever piece looks good, and I just yank it. Uh, and what I'm going to look for is those longer barbs. Not at the very end because those kind of look junky. But I'm going to grab a, a clump, just a clump of hair. And, and you don't want to go, you don't want to do too much. You want to do just a little bit, and I'm, I'm bringing it out, and I'm going to rip it in the opposite direction, right? So I hold on to that Chris bundle. Also asked what thread you're using. What thread am I using? Uh, who asked? Christopher Gosselin. Chris, uh, so that, this thread is, uh, the brand is Danville. Danville's awesome. It's Fly Wax Master. Uh, it's waxed thread. It's pre-waxed. I like the wax thread a lot of times because it has that bite when I need it. I don't really find myself using unwaxed thread too much where I'd have to wax it myself. A lot of times I kind of want that bite. Unless I'm cinching down like wings and shit and I need it to slip. That's a whole different story. Um, but right now it's it's a Danville Flymaster waxed um, and it's a uh, 70 denier. Pretty standard. Uh, like I said in my last video, 70 denier will get you pretty much anywhere for a lot. All right. And so what I do is I just, I take the, I take the, the bundle of tail material that I have and I'm not letting go of my grip. And what I'm doing is I'm just going to measure the length that the shank is, is going to be the length of the tail. These are basic proportions. This is stuff that this is like fly fly tying 101 is is proportions. When your flies look funky in the beginning, it's because it's usually disproportionate. The tail's too long, the the hackle is not appropriate to the size of the hook. Um you know, uh, all sorts of weird stuff. Uh so my advice with this too is when you are measuring this stuff, it's training your eye. Um, to make sure that these things are, are, uh, looking right. And after a while, sometimes you don't even need to do that anymore, but especially in the beginning, these, these guidelines are built for a reason. Uh, so really try to abide by them and learn the rules first before you decide to break them. So, um, so Jay, I've been having a problem with my thread breaking on me. Is this bad thread or am I doing something wrong? Uh, it could be bad thread. It depends on what it is. If it's really, uh, if it's really light thread, like a really, uh, high, uh, low denier, um, which is the diameter of the thread, um, and you're kind of using it outside of its own range, yeah, it's gonna break. Uh, if you're just starting out, I would probably steer away from, from really light threads, because you're going to get really frustrated um, uh, very quickly because it, your your uh, muscle memory and your pressure and tension is not really dialed in yet. So you're going to break shit left and right if, if, you, uh, if you don't really have the control. So uh, I really, I think that to start off, 70 denier is, is a good, uh, like an 8 aught or, or a, I would say like an 8 aught or a 6 aught. Um, that's the six slash zero or eight slash zero. Uh, and then your equivalent is going to be about 70 or 72 denier. Um, and if you keep finding that you're breaking the thread, uh, if it, you're just beginning, it's probably, it, it's probably you, um, which is okay. We've all done it. Um, or it could be shitty thread. It could, uh, it, it's kind of hard to say. Uh, I would definitely keep check, keep those things in check in your head. Uh, and then also, if uh, you want to maybe check your bobbin for damage, take a Q-tip, roll it in that tip of that barrel, and if it fibers catch on anything, you know that you got a nick in there, and that'll cut your thread. So kind of really check, is your is your thread getting cut, or is your thread get being broken? Um, if you feel like it breaks every time that you go to cinch material down, it's probably you. It's perfect hatch 6 aught. Uh, so, so Jay, for six aught, uh, I would probably say to, to ease up on the tension a little bit, uh, and I, I would, I would re remember the brakes that I was saying, you kind of put your brakes on the bobbin with your hand, it's a squeezing kind of pressure, uh, I would really pay, uh, mind to your, your grip on the bobbin, and, and, uh, 
make sure that you're not holding on to it for dear life because that will also that usually will break the thread uh or you're trying to cinch down uh material a lot of material down like a bundle of elk hair uh and and it's you're using too much tension and it's snapping if you have something like a right bobbin which is this it's got that little dial on there i would dial back maybe uh two clicks and each one is worth about a half an ounce of uh tension so yeah you got it jay so I'm going to take the tail, I'm going to measure about a, a shank length down, I'm going to bring it right to where that thread's going vertical. So the pinch tip of my fingers is going to go right to that point. Imagine like crosshairs. That's where it's landing. And I'm going to put it right there. I'm going to take my other my my left finger and I'm going to I'm going to grab that and I'm also grabbing the hook bend. My whole finger is covering that back part. And I'm going to lift the thread between my fingers. I'm going to pinch the thread, it's called a pinch wrap, pinch the thread between my fingers, bring it down alongside the other side of the shank, down, and then you could go probably one more time, eh, hell, one more time, all right, three. This is where I do my, I check in, I want to see where the hell everything's at before I continue. Um, so a, a really good word of advice that Davy McPhail tends to give a lot of people. And I always, I always, always remember this. If you're not happy with it, you can always go back. And I will say that Davy's right 99% of the time. I mean, there's some stuff where once it's mounted in, I mean, you, you know, if you glued it, what the hell are you going to do? But for the, what he means is, is that for the most part, if you're unhappy with it, reverse it. You're not you're not married to that that step. So if you find that the tail ain't right, read just just unwrap those things, uh, re fix yourself, uh, tr mount it down again, and and see where you land. And do keep doing that until you're you're happy with where you're at. If you're not happy with it, just reverse it. it you have nothing to lose. So I, I absolutely agree with Davey McPhail. If you're not happy with it, you can most of the time always go back. Uh, so once I see that this is kind of where I want it, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flatten that thread again, and I'm going to secure that down. So I'm going to take a few wraps, not to go into the bend, because if I go back into the bend, the tail's going to go... And uh, that's also kind of a look and proportion thing. That's that's no that's no bueno. So uh, so says good job. who? Timmy. Thanks, Tim. So after the, after the tail's where I want it to be, I'm gonna take my wraps and I'm gonna start to walk forward with it until all that crap disappears under the thread. And you are going to get better at this and faster at it the more you do it. Um. Take your time. It's not a marath. It's it's not a rush. It's not a it's not a race. You don't have to worry about that stuff yet, right? So once that's secure, I'm gonna I'm gonna um, what I'm gonna do is just for just to secure the um, material, I'm gonna use just a little bit of wire that I just dropped. I'm going to use just uh I'm going to use UTC's small gold. UTC is the shit, especially their threads. They're just kind of hard to find over here. They're really big in England. UTC is awesome. Uh, their wire I find everywhere over here. Thread. Eh. So, I uh, got another question. Oh, nice. oh, Matt. Great detail for beginner tires loving this right now. You could have saved me a lot of headaches. Uh, yeah, word, Matt, uh, thank you. That's what I'm trying to do. I don't really think that a lot of people get into the specific details and that's what I'm trying to do without confusing the shit out of people. I want to, I want to explain it in a perspective that I went through and I remember what it was like. Uh, so, uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, the wire, I'm going to do it on, um, I'm going to do it on my far side, which is on the other side of the shank. And just a couple soft ones, and then when you see it... Now, you could always take your nail and push the wire 
where the thread wraps started and you could move the wire on either side of the hook shank. So, you know, if you decide that you need it on the other side, if you're doing counter wraps or anything like that, uh, just use your nail and just lightly kind of press on those thread wraps that you just made. And you could slide the wire to either uh, side of the hook without losing it. Um, so once that's on there and I'm happy with where that wants to go, I'm going to hold it down alongside of the hook. And I'm just going to continue as I'm pulling away with the wire and not hard, just, just, just a little bit. I'm going to wrap the thread down until I meet that that spot that's right where the tail is coming out of but don't go right up to the tail give it just a hair back because when you start a material after that it's going to kind of press into the tail so it, you don't have to get super close all right so once this is the wire is here i could put this in my material clip it's just a slinky wire and that holds it and out of its way. So the next thing I'm going to do is, uh, this is what I was talking about last night, dubbing. Uh, I'm going to dub, I'm going to dub squirrel dubbing on there. This is from SLF, Synthetic Living Fibers. I talked about this yesterday. I love this shit because it's buggy as fuck. It's, it's real spiky and it's got, it's just got a really, really neat look to it. And you could rough it up with, with, uh, you know, with a dubbing brush and make it look even buggier. That's what fish like too. A trout really love that stuff. The buggier it looks, the more it sells. So uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go for that rust. And I'm going to... Um, when I take dubbing out, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a clump that's probably more than what I need. And then I'm going to take that clump and I'm going to take a piece out of that of what I need. And this way I'm making sure that I never am taking too much at once. So as you're, when you start your dubbing noodle, a lot of guys have a tendency to put on too much too fast. And you're going to find that the material tends to uh, kind of just, you know, uh, noodle itself, but it's not really gripping onto the thread. It's just kind of, um, it's just kind of spiraling around it. And you get frustrated because it looks like it's not sticking. And you're like, what, what the fuck? Why, why isn't that stuff? Get, get on there. Um, and then guys will go and they're like, oh, fuck it, I need wax. Let me go get wax. And then they, you know, they, you know, they, they put all the crap all over the thread and all that stuff. Uh, wax is good if you really want to use it. I don't have time for wax a lot of times. So I, my, my advice when you start your dubbing noodle is to go very, very little wisps at first and color enough just to color the thread and when you do that you're building just a foundation once the foundation is down onto the thread you can continuously start twisting more and more and more and you're building up that that shape that tapered noodle that that you're always here they're talking about but you can't do this with a big clump of shit in your fingers you gotta you gotta start off with a little bit and then the, when you add more to it, it sticks like that. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna grab some fibers, and what I do is I grab and I bring it right to the thread. Grab, and then bring it to the thread. So I'm gonna start right there, and I'm gonna just twist in one single direction, like this. Okay. And I'm pull this down if you want more. More wisps. Okay. And as I'm doing this, I'm building, I'm building that, I'm building that, uh, that taper as I go. And I'm trying to work my way around this board that I have in front of my face. All right. And you could always add more and believe it or not, you could also remove it a little trickier, but you could do it. Okay. So once I have a pretty good noodle to start, I'm going to start wrapping until I see it touch the hook. And then I'm going to really zero in on where it's going to start landing. Right there. And as I'm doing it, I'm watching the taper get start off small and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And as I'm doing that, a really good piece of advice uh, that I learned in art school 
when I was having trouble, when I would see too much. And when I see too much detail, you you tend to miss the overall bigger picture. Uh, and what I'm really getting at is the overall profile of the fly. You're looking for the silhouette shape of it. And as you're doing this taper, it's so easy to start to get into focusing on on uh, the 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 um, fibers and stuff that you know you're wrapping up the shank and then you look back and you go, ah, fuck, that looks like shit. It's not tapered at all, or it's a pile of crap in one area and not in the other. So what I like to do is I like to kind of just I kind of like to blur out of focus uh, the tiny little details, and I'm really just watching the silhouette grow. And I'll, uh, when I start to see something falter as I'm wrapping the dubbing, that's how I know that um, the taper is, is not tapering the way I want it to. I'm paying attention to the silhouette. I'm not paying attention to just the tiny little wrapping fibers and stuff as it goes. Does that make sense? So as I'm doing this and see how I'm starting to see it droop again, that means that I'm running out of dubbing. That means that I need more. When I start to see that taper taper down, when I'm when I'm wanting it to build up, then I know that I need more because I'm running out. You see it? And I'm gonna grab a little bit more of a chunk. All right. And as I'm twisting this again, I'm doing it in one direction only, like this. And I'm going to wrap this until I see that taper start again. And if you don't feel like it's getting wider, stay in the same area and it'll start to widen. Just stay there. Matthew said great advice. Thank you. Who? Matthew. Matthew, thanks, man. Um... So that's really what I'm looking for too is is to see it continuously build. Did you ever uh did you ever notice with like uh crayons uh when you're coloring? I do this with my son uh all the time is when you're coloring uh you press harder when you want all those little spots of white to fill in on the page, but you don't really need to do that. You just kind of need you just kind of need to stay in that same area and continue the strokes and it will build up on itself. It's kind of the same thing when I'm when I'm wrapping. If I stay in that area long enough, the material is going to build up and start to taper, uh, you know, and get bigger. Um, so once I get to a point that I want to with the length, I'm factoring in how far do I want to go up this thing before I am going to need room for my other materials. Remember how I started a little bit back on the eye? Uh, that's why. So uh, this is about where I'm going to stop. And I could take my fingers and I could rake the material back a little bit. And I'm going to build up just a tiny little stop point right there. Right Now that wire that I have, I'm going to take the wire and I'm going to come under. And Joseph Kinney says, this is great. Lots of information, bro. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Who was that? Joseph Kinney. Joe, thanks, man. Uh, and what I'm doing is I'm looking for even spacing of my wraps to segment it. If they're not even, just redo it. Just go back. I don't like. Don't feel. I know in the beginning you're 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 so. Oh my god. Oh my god. It's actually coming out all right. I gotta just keep going. And you don't want to stop your momentum. I re I remember that. And uh, you don't want to stop your momentum, but at some point. You're, you finish the, you know, like, let's say those wraps and then you look back on it and you go, yeah, well, I could have done better with the segmentation. Um, well, if that's the case, then I would, I would just simply unwrap the wire and redo it. So if I, let's, for instance, if I took this wrap right now and I went to wrap over and I noticed that it wasn't even, I would just go back, readjust and then do it again. Um, so when you're, when you're doing this stuff, like Davey McPhail says, you could always go back literally <laughs> right in the middle of what you're doing. And, and it's, and it's not that, it's not that hard. It, you just have to catch yourself doing it. 
All right, so I'm going to do about four, and then my last one is going to reach that that stopping point right there, and I'm meeting my thread. That's where we that's where we meet to hang out. What's going on there, wire? So I'm going to take the wire and pull it up, and I'm taking my bobbin, and I'm moving the thread over to the other side about two or three times to secure it. Uh, Matt, overthinking like a motherfucker, the good old days. Yeah, seriously, uh, y you do. Um, so, so I take a, a wrap or two or three in front, and then what they say is you could helicopter the wire off. I usually like to do that because I don't like to damage um, scissors cutting metal um, wire. So by helicoptering it off, what you do is... And uh, Tim will sh uh, Flagler will show you. He brings the bobbin up to kind of brace for impact where it's touching, and then you grab the wire and you just you pinch with your nails. Actually, this is a pretty good uh, word of advice. Don't pinch with your skin too much because your skin tends to uh, not really bite the wire. Uh, what you're really looking for is the wire not to rotate at all. So I use my nails and I pinch that one point that's close and I rotate in one direction until it breaks off and it'll snap off a lot quicker. All right. So once I have the tail, I have the tail down, I have the uh, dubbing down, I have the wire down. You could clip any stray hairs that you see. And again, there's a lot of tires out there, especially the older tires that learned how to tie with scissors in hand, like I went over in my other video. I can't do it. I tried. I just pick them up. I got a spot right here, and I could grab them without even looking, but I can't. I can't tie with them in hand. I just, I lose control. Uh, so once I have the dubbing, I have the tail, I got the wire that's securing it. Uh, what you can do is you could take a dubbing brush. And you could rough this up if you find that the the dubbing's too tight. Like if you if you don't want it to be such a tight wrapped noodle, uh, you know, or you dubbed it too tight, you could always do you could always rough it up um, just by you know picking out some fibers. And like like I said, fish love buggy shit, so it's never going to hurt uh, for you to rough up some stuff. Yeah, you know, you do you, you rough them up. So, uh, so I'm gonna go back to that hen saddle again, and I'm going to do a soft hackle collar uh, with the same material I used for the tail. Like I told you, this hen the hen stuff is so versatile. You could use it for a lot of shit. And I mean, I'm tying this wet fly with with very minimal amount of materials here. So as I'm looking at the feathers, what I am looking for when I pick out the right one is uh, one that doesn't have any frayed tips or any piece that looks like shit. Uh, you you don't want anything that looks like shit. So if, if in that if there's a piece that looks like that, I will save that for uh, I could I could pick off pieces on that feather that that's for like tail but i'm not going to use that for for wrapping the collar for the collar i want that that raking that raking profile where all the fibers are nice uh so i found a piece pop and uh what i'm gonna do for the this is a technique that's done with a lot of feathers that you're using to wrap um, CDC, all that marabou, all that stuff. This is a, a beginner technique that, uh, you will get better at as you continue to do it. Um, but my advice is to, um, find that point, grab the, the slightest bit of the tip, and I'm going to pull, I'm going to rake and comb everything away from that in an opposite direction until I find this V that I'm looking for. You see it? I'll show it over here too. That's your tie-in point. That's that's the spot that you're going to... That's the thing that you're going to secure to the to the hook. That's going to set you up for wrapping the feather. So I'm going to have the, the, the V that's going out from the top and then all the other fibers are going to be raking in an opposite direction. And I'm going to take that V... 
and I'm going to I'm gonna find like a bow tie. And I'm gonna I'm gonna tie down that bow tie right there. Take the thread, and I'm gonna do a soft wrap. What the hell is a soft wrap? It's exactly what it says. It's 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 a wrap that's done softly. I not like a real hard torque around the hook. What I'm doing is I'm gonna bring it up and over the material, but I'm not. I'm not causing any torque yet. I'm just draping the thread over the material. And I'm going to go one, pull a little, two, and then pull. And then one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And then once I start that bed, I can take that tip and I could clip it off. And remember how I told you that it's really important to finish off your fly clean, that the head is clean. That's what I'm talking about is that you want, you want plenty of room to finish off your stuff because when you're, when you find yourself at that point and the fly is almost done and you got barely any room left, what a fucking disappointment that is. That's it. You're like, how the fuck am I going to fix this? I did all this shit, the fly looks great, and it's going to crowd the hook eye, and the whole fucking thing's going to be wasted anyways. Maybe pull up in your comments, because I can't always... So, that's really, that's really what, what, uh, my advice is for that. Uh, so, um, uh, this is going to be a lot of... Alright, so I'm glad that you guys are enjoying it so far. Uh, you guys have any questions so far up to this point? I haven't been looking at the comments too much, because I'm... It's hard to do both, but do you guys have any questions? Chris, I tie lots of grouse and pheasant tail, uh, sold hackle, killers in my rivers quick and easy. Uh, yeah, pheasant tail's another really, really, really big, uh, pheasant tail soft hackles. Yeah, f so f guys, pheasant tail, this is a material I, I kind of forgot to mention in my last video, but one of the first materials that you ever get is pheasant tail. They come in all sorts of colors. I probably start off with natural pheasant tail. Uh, Christ, you use you use that stuff a lot. Uh, where would we be without those pheasants? Uh, so yeah, Chris, soft tackle pheasant tails and shit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so remember what I told you about soft tackles. It gives a lot of movement. Um. Uh, a friend of mine, a, a fantastic fly tire, um, told me that, uh, you know, that, that, that word is, uh, to, to make the fly animate. Uh, so when, you know, that fly is in the water, even the current itself is going to give it this, this shimmering dancing, um, appearance. Uh, Timmy, yeah. Partridge too is a great soft hackle. Um, that's super popular as well. Um, but really what you're looking for is that movement and that's why soft tackle, uh, collars are, are really, really, uh, good to add to any fly. Um, they're, they're, it's indispensable. Jay, I need a new bobbin. Have had my Cabela's brand with no tensioner for over a year. Maybe a good vice. What brand of each do you recommend? Average budget, nothing crazy. Um, so for a bobbin. I'm going to be partial to what I have, and that's me. Uh, it is not a cheap bobbin per se, like something like these. These are very traditional bobbins. This is what a lot of guys started off on before they got too fancy. There's nothing wrong with these. Some guys really, really prefer still to use these no matter what the hell comes out in terms of uh, technology. I don't have a problem with them. But I do have one that I like more. Um, it's in my hand all the time. Yeah, exactly, Chris. I, I, it's in my hand all the time. It's one of my primary tools. Uh, if I find something better that works for me, uh, I'm going to be the guy that advocates that one. <laughs> so uh, when it comes to this, I'm going to have to say that the right bobbin, R-I-T-E, the right bobbin is the right bobbin. <laughs> uh, you're going to find them in about the $24, $28 range. I know that the bigger ones, 
The bigger ones are, are maybe like 30 or something like that. But I mean, like how many times are you going to buy the damn thing? Uh, it, it's a one is really all you need. And then you could have the other ones that are more simple, but your primary bobbin, uh, I would, Jay, I would recommend getting the right bobbin and my right bobbin that I particularly use is the standard half hitch. Um, I do have a shorty that's uh it's a little guy. Some guys like it cause it fits in their hand a little bit better. It's smaller. It's also got a ceramic tube that adds to some smooth tying. I really am not that particular about ceramic. Um, it's nice. It feels smooth, of course. Uh, the half hitch is stainless, and uh, it is also smooth as shit. And the reason for that is that they uh, they uh, machined it very well. Uh, it's well made. So the problems that you would find in cheap bobbins that don't have a ceramic tube, that's not the issue when it comes to the right bobbins, uh, the standard half hitch. Uh, I like the standard half hitch as well because it has uh, reach. It's long. It's a little longer. I like my stuff to be a little bit away from my hand. I don't like to crowd up on the fly with this this short, tiny little bobbin that my whole hand engulfs, and I feel like my thumbs are all up in its shit. Uh, I really don't like that. I like to be away from it. So I prefer the the right bobbin uh, standard half hitch, uh, and then the shorty is good for you know, other stuff. So, uh, and as far as a brand J, uh, for a good vice, probably peak rotary, uh, or, uh, the Renzetti traveler, 180 bucks. Uh, I would not, I probably would not, uh, unless you're, uh, like you said, it's something that's nothing too crazy. I would have to say that unless you are really knowing what you're looking for and want, uh, I, this is, this vice was about 650 bucks. It's got custom color on it. It's got the stainless steel jaws, the brass pedestal base. Uh, th that's what I wanted. Do you necessarily need all that stuff? Not for everyone. So I, I think that a, a really great vice at a really great price point, that's going to give you pretty much everything that you'll need for a while is a Renzetti Traveler or um, the Peak Rotary Vice? Those are those are two pretty solid ones that are under two hundred. Uh, Chris, ceramic, yeah, like I said, ceramic, ceramic's good. It's it's not the end all be all though. I I'll take it or leave it. They're both nice. Uh, so Matt, whip finish was my arch enemy. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm getting to when I finish this thing. A lot of people hate that damn thing. Um, a whip finisher can be a very intimidating tool. Uh, it's, it's, it's weird looking, uh, guys that just get into this hobby, they, uh, or, or passion, uh, they get into the whip finisher and they look at the thing and they go, what the fuck is that? You know, how the hell do you, how the hell do you, where do you even start on that damn thing? You know, it's, it is, it's a funky looking tool that's very intimidating to people. Um, and some guys struggle with it more than others. It all depends, but I'm going to show you how the way I do it. And hopefully I will demystify it and make it a little bit more simple. Um, so, uh, back to the, back to the soft hackle wrapping. This is how you get a really nice wrap. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to grab the highest point of, of this feather and I'm going to have this spine and I have the, I have the, the fibers coming out on both sides of the spine like this, like a V and you got the spine down the middle and they come out like this. So what I do is I take my fingers, I bring it, I bring it to the front and I comb just by bringing this, just by bringing these two fingers into the spine, it's going to part the fibers on one side or the other of the spine, just like it naturally is. And I'm going to rake it back gently. Don't pull because you'll pop that, that, uh, that tie in point out and you're going to have to redo it. And sometimes if it's really brittle or it's light, sometimes it does that. Even, even if you had a good secure thing, it shit happens. So take your fingers and rake these fibers back gently until you see them on either or side of the spine and take your time doing this. And some guys will wet their fingers 
make sure your hands are very, very clean because of all this crazy shit that's going on right now. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to rake these fibers back so that they're folding kind of in one direction. And once I see that they're kind of just on one side and the spine is up front, I'm going to, I'm going to comb the bottom ones that are closest to the hook and I'm going to hold these back and I'm going to go down. Fuck. And I just broke it. Hold on one second. I told you it happens. Not a big deal. Tie in the material again. Okay. Let's start over. Rake the material back. And I'm going to go down. And I can brush it back. Pinch. Grab. Brush back, brush back. Pull back. Down. And as I'm doing this, I'm raking this stuff backwards, but I'm also moving slightly forward with every turn. Trying not to trap any fibers. And again, I'm doing this until I'm happy. I'll do it until it looks full. I'm not going to overdo it and, and have it look too crowded. But I'm going to do it until I'm happy with where I want it and or how full I want it. A lot of guys tend to go too much. It also looks like shit when there's too little. So I'm going to go maybe one more time around. And remember, like I said, if you find that you did one wrap too many, just reverse it. Okay. Once that's done, I'm going to rake up the stuff that I'm not going to use as much as I can. See it? And I'm going to pull these fibers back. Pull this away from it a little bit. And once I find that that's pretty full and that's where I want it to, to stop, this is where I'm going to cross my thread over. And this is just the start of me securing my work down to where I'm happy with it. I want to, I want to stop it right there. I'm leaving enough room and there's still just about a hook eyes distance behind the hook eye. It's always good to give one in front just in case. Okay. Now, once that's secured, I could take this and if you ever have a hard time finding that the material that you're cutting away is mixed in with the material that you're keeping, what I like to do is pinch the tip of this and spin it, rotate it. Like I like I do the dubbing noodle. And what it does is it'll swing those fibers away from your your work that you're keeping. And you'll find it separate away from the other stuff. And that's how you get into that little spot where you don't cut into your, your uh, fibers that you're keeping. Uh, so when I find that, I, I will spin it until it rotates and swings those fibers away from it. And then I'll take it. clip it. Now at this point, I'll take one or two more wraps and then I'm going to check it out. This is where I check in, right? If I'm not happy with something at this point, I could very easily unwrap my thread, yank the whole fucking collar off and do it all over again. If it looks unsatisfactory to you in any way, don't settle. Um, you do it again. You're going to learn more doing it again than you settling. You finish the fly and then you look at it and you go, yeah, I know I could have done better on that soft tackle, but you know, I was already too far gone at that point. You're not, uh, when this is the time to check it, because if you need to do it over again, this is the time to undo your work. So I like to do what I say is check in. So I, I rotate 
and see how everything's looking on both sides. Um, if you ever did sculpting um, from a model and stuff like that, you know how they, they always tell you to, to walk around and move constantly so that you can see all perspectives of the work. It's the same thing with the fly. I always check at all the sides before I move on to make sure that it doesn't look awesome on, on my side. And then when, I, when I'm done and I flip it over, the, the far side of your work looks like shit. <clears throat> so he wanted he wanted to look good everywhere um so once i feel like that's kind of where uh i need it and it's it's as full as i want it i'm gonna take my finger my three fingers all right and, and you uh, see that little triangle that i make with it i'm gonna take that hole and i'm gonna put the eye through it and i'm gonna rake this material back and grab it with this finger and i'm gonna do it again and rake all that material back like it's wet and hold it so it's like a little torpedo and then I'm gonna take the thread and now that I am settled on it I'm gonna wrap forward and clean up all whatever fibers are sticking in the front and I'm gonna take a few wraps back into that soft hackle not too deep just about like the width of the thread itself and it will it will give you that very raked back appearance. You see it? When you do that. And then to finish the head, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to build up a little bit more thread so it has that really pretty finish to it. Because really what I look for uh, it, with, with, uh, with the finish to um, any fly, but really wet flies and, and salmon flies and all the, all the, re the really pretty ones is uh how they finish the the fly at the head that that tells me a lot so i'm going to take my thread and i'm going to flatten the thread so i'm going to spin it and i'm going to look for that v i'm going to zoom in for a second so you could watch this i'm going to spin the thread until it flattens and I'm not going to go back into the soft hackle anymore, all right? Where I stopped is that's it. I don't go back further than that. That's it. And I'm going to, with the flattened thread, I'm going to start to build up this kind of cone shape. Walking back and forth from that point forward. And this is all smoothed out and nice looking. And I'm going to spin it. Flatten it again until I see that little triangle. And I'm going to do it again. And I'm going to build this head up a little bit so that it's not this wimpy dimpy little thing. Alright. And then once once I'm happy with with the thickness of, of that head. And that's the kind of shape that I'm looking for. And it's going to flatten out again. All right. And I'm going to wrap it one more time just to do that final shape. That's where I want it. All right. Once I have that final shape, uh, this is where I'm going to start to get ready to whip finish. That bastard of a tool. So this is how I whip finish. Other guys might do it another way. This is what makes sense to me and has been working ever since. So all I'm going to do is I'm not going to take the I'm not going to take the tool and do it this way. I'm not going to be doing it this way. I'm going to flip it upside down that way. And I'm going to imagine that this is like a little like a little little monkey arm. All right? And it's and it's kind of like this, right? And it's gonna it's gonna grab it's gonna hook onto the the tree branch. So I'm gonna bring my 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 thread towards me, and I'm gonna latch the 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 hand onto the tree branch, and I'm going to lift my thread up and go around the tree. I'm gonna do that again. 
threads towards me. I'm going to put the thread on. I'm going to put the hand onto the tree branch. And I'm going to go in front of the tree branch. Go behind the tree branch. And I'm going to go straight across and I'm going to have crosshairs. You see that? Now what do I do with the crosshairs? I'm going to bring that elbow up. See it? And I'm going to pull my bobbin that way. That's going to bring the crosshairs to where I want to target my finish. See it? If I relax, if I pull. I find the spot that I want to do it. And when the crosshairs are set and that's where I want to shoot, I'm going to take that elbow that's up top and I'm just going to do revolutions. One, two, three. And if I need more material, if I feel like I'm getting too tight, pull the bobbin away and feed more thread. And as I lift up, it's going to take, see how I could take more? One more time. When the elbow is up, I'm going to bring that knob of the whip finisher forward. It releases. And I'm going to take the bobbin and I'm going to go up as I'm lowering that monkey hand down. To the fly. And when it meets the head and I'm touching the hook. As I keep tension on this thread, I just slide this out. It's done. Take your scissors, get close. And that's how you whip finish. That's how, that's how Scott whip finishes. Um, do you guys have any questions before I do a final touch on this? The way that I finish these flies after I'm done doing that, it's not necessary, um, but I like to do it, is I like to use some resin. Fly Tire's favorite toy. They'll build houses with it if they really could. Uh, <laughs> I use Loon Outdoors, UV Clear. I use the thin stuff. Why do I use the thin stuff? I use the thin stuff because uh, I like to build up if I need to. I don't like it too thick too too soon uh, because I can't control that as much as if I had layers going on. So when it comes to uh, when it comes to resin, I like the thin stuff's really good because I could always add more if it's too thick and it blobs on there. Mm. So I'm gonna take it and I'm gonna do this gentle squeeze until I'm gonna do this gentle squeeze until I just see the. I'll actually see the liquid fill up in the nozzle as I'm squeezing, and then I know that it's coming. Diane's is very informative. Thank you. See, now I'm going to... Thank you, Diane. I'm going to just tap the, the, the thread without touching the soft tackle. I'm just touching the thread and dabbing it over and over again um, until I get this really polished head on it. And again, with this with this resin, I could kind of manipulate it however I want, just by touching it with the tip of the uh, dispenser. And when I get that shape that I'm looking for, which is just about that, I'm going to grab my UV torch and I'm just going to fire that up. And that will lock everything into place. And this will harden in about 10 seconds. If you have a really strong UV light, it hardens really quick. If you have a weak one, I'd stay on it a little longer. And that is my finished wet fly. Very similar to a March Brown. Maybe change a little colors here and there, but... Um, you know, colors in nature vary as well, and bugs all don't look the same every single time. So, uh, don't feel like you can't change 
have color variation or anything like that. I'm trying to zoom out so you don't, you know, get all up in my face, but it's not really working. Jay, super glue is a really good alternative to resin. Uh, the problem that I have with super glue when it comes to really tight areas is um, super glue, you got to be really careful because if you accidentally drop some of it on any place, uh, it's going to be one big shit show, uh, of a problem, especially if it dripped all over your vice and then your instinct is to wipe it off and then you wipe it with your hand and then you glue your hand to your vice. So in the very beginning, I would probably stay away from super glues because, uh, I, I think that you're just asking for a disaster uh, in the very beginning and shit. Uh, I think head cement is probably a better way to go. It's more forgiving. It's not going to dry for a little bit later. So if you do need to wipe it off on something, it's not so permanent. Um, so head cement is really good. Head cement's really good too, because it saturates the thread wraps. So when you really want, uh, something to get in deep, uh, head cement is really good for that saturation. The UV thin also does that, but your head cement is a little bit more penetrative, um, so I, if I do use a head cement, I like to use Loon Outdoors, the, the hard head clear. I don't use it a lot, but if I do, this is the stuff that I use. There's a lot of head cements that are, that are good. They all kind of do the same shit. Um, and for, if you are going to use a super glue, um, I like to use the Gorilla Super Glue Gel. The reason why I like to use the gel is because it, it's forgiving for a few moments and it doesn't it doesn't harden in, in a second. You can move it with a with a bodkin. What the hell is a bodkin? It's it's a it's a tool, it's just a little needle tip, just so that you could you use it for all sorts of stuff. Uh, so if you want to do that, um, I have noticed that the gel is a little bit more uh, time forgiving so that you can kind of move it around if you have to and it doesn't solidify really quick. But uh, in the beginning, I would probably stay away from super glue. But later on, when you feel like you're all right to, to take that risk, um, go for it. The thing that I love about the resin is it gives this really, really beautiful shine. Um, it, it, it really polishes the heads uh, unlike any other finish um so the 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 resin i'm i'm partial with because of the way that it looks when it's done um but either or they'll all secure thread um <laughs> wyatt yeah i wyatt i i kind of talk i i i talk on here the way i really am uh if you meet me in person uh no difference uh, so yeah, I, I wanted these videos to be very authentic and real, and I don't want to pretend to be some personality that I'm not. Uh, so <laughs> what, what you see is exactly what you get. <laughs> um, I, I don't filter my language at all either. No, uh, especially when I break thread. Yeah. Um, Timmy hardhead water base and odorless. Yeah, hardhead. Yeah, hardheads. Hardheads, good. It is. Uh, uh, it is water based and odorless. Uh, that's a lot of guys will use hard as nails. It's a Sally Hansen. It's what chicks use for for their fucking for their nails. And uh, a lot of guys swear by that stuff, but it it f fucking stinks. Uh, I I don't know why anyone would want to smell that crap while they're tying flies. It's really just it's, it's stinky shit. Um, if you could get over that though, you can, you, I guess you use that. I, I don't know what it means chemical wise or when it gets into the water. I don't really know what the hell that stuff is made up of. I don't really think that I, I, I don't know. I'm kind of, I'm not into that kind of stuff. I, I use what, what's, uh, what I know works and it's not so funky. Um, so yeah. Uh, does anybody have any questions, uh, about what I did? Um, any comments, uh, anything that I didn't really hit on, anything you're still confused by that you need help with? Are there any problems that you guys are going through that, that you want answered? Um, otherwise that's pretty much, um, 
that's pretty much where I'm at for this video tonight. All right. I don't really see any more questions. Um, you could always message me if you want. Uh, yeah, Timmy. Yeah, word. Uh, ideal for flats, flies. Yeah, no smell. Yeah, you, you don't want... I, I don't know if you'd want a fly that goes into the water smelling like nail polish. Um, I hate whip finishing. Is there any other way to finish my fly? Uh, yes. Uh, that, that's, let me go do this real quick. Uh, there is one way to finish the fly. If you really, really hate, um, whip finishing, whip finishing is the most secure finish, uh, which is why I like to do it. But real quick, how I would do it, if I really, really want to kill that whip finisher, uh, you could do what's called a half hitch. Um, and if I'm finishing the fly and I don't want to use that, what I'm going to do is, uh, there's, there's a, there's a tool. Sometimes they're built into your tool. My bodkin has it. It's this little tube. You see it? And it's tapered like a, like a pencil, like a number two pencil, but it's got a hole in it. And what I do is I'm going to put it up against the eye of the of the fly, right? That's where it's going to end up going. So when I want to half hitch it, um, that's where it's going to go. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my I'm going to take my thread, and I'm going to take the thread, wrap it over once. Bring it up to the eye and pull down and in. Up and over, bring it to the eye, let it slide down the slope and in. And up and over again, put it up and in. And you will be able to half hitch your work. And I would do that to be secure. I'd probably do that about four or five times just to be safe. Um, because my whip finish is usually just about the same uh, amount of revolutions unless I'm unless I'm doing something specific. But um, I would say that that's a pretty secure amount of half hitches uh, so that your fly doesn't come undone. Although a whip finish is more secure, the half hitches will do fine if you really fucking hate them. Uh, so that is another option is, is a half hitch. Does anyone have any questions about half hitching to finish the fly? Does anyone want to see that one more time or are you good? And I have an exacto knife uh, so that I don't, I don't need to, I don't need that on my hook if I'm not really gonna. All right. Is there any other questions? Otherwise, I'm gonna call it a night. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining in, guys. I really appreciate the. Uh, hi, Monica. Uh, I, I really appreciate the, um, the audience and, and I really appreciate the questions. Uh, thank you for, for asking. I, I do like questions, um, because I, I also remember what it's like when, when you need a lot answered and, and you're not getting the answers. So I am, I'm here for the questions. Uh, otherwise I'll probably do this again tomorrow night, uh, and I'll have another subject to go over, uh, or subjects. Um, and, uh, hopefully this was, hi, <laughs> uh, hopefully this was, this was cool to watch and it wasn't, it wasn't too boring and, uh, you guys were entertained and, and you learned a lot and, uh, happy tying to all you guys out there and keep it up. Uh, you might get pissed off and you might want to throw your stuff across the room, but that's, that's all part of that beautiful process is, uh getting real pissed off sometimes, but you, 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 uh, you push on, uh, you'll get there. All right. So thanks a lot. And I will see you guys next time. Have a good night.